Hi, my name is Nico Stuurman and I'll be talking today about detectors. So for many, many centuries, we haven't really seen detectors as an important part of the microscope. And that is because we used to just simply look through the eyepiece, observe what we saw, and then document that through these beautiful drawings, like this one here made by Raymond y Cajal. So with the advent of cameras, that whole picture changed, and we can now use a, uh, a modern microscope and the associated cameras to document in a more um, uh, objective way what is being observed through the microscope. And an important part of that is also the, the computer, since in the end the data from that camera will end up in the computer and form the real image. So not only can we now make much more reliable measurements, we can also do things like shown here, we can make movies, time-lapse sequences of uh, uh, living specimens in, uh, that we observe through the microscope. So here you see a uh, cell going through mitosis, labeled in red for histone, DNA, and in green for microtubules. So in this talk, I, there, I will uh, discuss two different types of detectors. One are uh, single point detectors, so they measure only a single point of light at the time. And the other are these multi-point detectors. So those are detectors that uh, measure multiple points simultaneously, i.e. Uh, cameras. Here you see an example of a single point detector, this photomultiplier tube, and here is a camera. Now all these types of detectors share the same principle. So they take in light in the form of photons and they convert that into electrons through the photoelectric effect. At a certain point, the uh, charge, the number of electrons is converted into a voltage and that voltage is then subsequently converted into a digital number that is being transported into the computer and the computer then uses that digital number to build up the image. So there's always the sequence that we go from an, uh, a charge to a voltage to a digital number. So first, for single point detectors. So what's happening there is that we have a beam of light, for instance, uh, going through a object that we image with the microscope. And then that beam of light in the end makes its way onto the detector. We then scan the sample. For instance, a very simple way is scanning the stage in X and Y, or we can actually scan that beam of light through the sample. And at the detector, we measure at every point in time how much light is falling onto it. We then convert that into a digital number. That digital number goes into the computer. We get this sequence, this sequence here of numbers and that um, is used to build up the image. So what's important with a single point scanner like this is that they're fast. Because since we measure each point individually, it takes a lot of time to build up the whole image. So we need those measurements very, very quickly. Now, multi-point detectors, cameras on the other hand, we use a lens to project the image straight onto this multi-point array. So we get an image formed onto the camera itself. But from then on, it's again more or less the same principle. All those photosensitive elements build up charge. At a certain point in time, the charge there is converted into a voltage, and in the end, it's converted into a sequence of numbers that is being sent to the computer and the computer uses that to build up the image. Okay, I'll now be talking about uh, two different types of single point detectors and then I'll switch to cameras and explain you more about how those work. So the most classical single point detector is this photomultiplier tube. So what that consists of is a photocathode and that photocathode is the element that converts incoming photons into an electron. So 
Once you have an electron, there are a couple of so-called dynodes that attract these uh, electro, uh, electrons and then also accelerate them and multiply them. So at each dynode, we get a multiplication of the number of electrodes that came in. We can um, tune the multiplication by tuning the voltage over these dynodes. Uh, the net effect of all of this is that the end, when we arrive here at the anode, is that we have a huge number of electrons for every electron that came in here initially. At that point, we're converting that uh, charge into a voltage, and then we read that out into a digital number, send it to the computer. So PMTs are very fast, they're highly linear, they have a very high gain, so they can literally measure single uh, electron hits. Um, so they're almost ideal uh, uh, measurement devices with the main pitfall is that they have a poor quantum efficiency. And quantum efficiency means for uh, uh, w what is the efficiency with which I convert a single photon into an electron. So this quantum efficiency of 25% means that you need, on average, four photons to hit that photocathode to get one electron in. And that electron you can then measure very, very well. Um, there are other types of designs for these PMTs, but they all work on the same principle using dynodes. Here you see an, a real example of what such a tube looks like. You can run them in different modes. So one mode is the photon counting mode, where you basically set a very, very high gain so that every photon that comes in and is converted into an electron is being counted as a single pulse. And that way you count photons. The advantage of this is that you have now no more background because either you have um, a hit or you don't have a hit. Um, the downside is that this is very, very slow. Um, a very nice example of this photon counting mode is what you see in Geiger counters. Geiger counters are basically a PMT with a scintillation material in front of it so that uh, radioactive material is uh, changed into a photon. That photon hits the photon cathode and with every hit is when you get a count and you can hear that in your Geiger counter. So the other mode is uh, a linear mode where we uh, measure the current in the end which is a much faster mode of operation but also has more noise. Now, in part, to overcome that low quantum efficiency, um, uh, there's a competing technology, and that is the uh, Avalanche photodiode, the APD. This is based on semiconductor material. It's actually very similar to the uh, CCD sensors used in cameras. So the semiconductor material absorbs photons, and then in this area here, there is, again, a high voltage. The, the electrons are accelerated, then hit that silicon with a high force. And through a process that's called impact ionization, they elicit extra electrons out of the material. And that amplifies the uh, signal. So it amplifies the charge. The charge is being read out and transferred in the end into a digital number. These have a much higher quantum efficiency than photomultipliers. They can also be used in this photon counting mode. Um, they're very useful. One of their downsides seems to be that you can, cannot run them as fast as photomultipliers since they tend to overheat when you go too fast. So this is an example of what an APD looks like in reality. Okay. So that was it for single point detectors. We'll now be talking about cameras. And cameras in microscopy tend to look like this, where there's a nice package with the electronics and some cooling around that central element that you see here, the actual photosensitive chip. So uh, the chip is the heart of the camera. And as you may be well aware, that chip 
consists of an array, rows and columns, of the photosensitive material. That photosensitive material itself is very much like that APD. It consists of um, silicon, um, semiconductor material. Um, it, they're produced in ways that are very similar to how the chips in our computer are produced. Um, photons hit that silicon through the photoelectric effect. The photons are converted into electrons and then they are most often kept for a while in this potential well so charge builds up in this well here. It's the, the basic principle. After that, we need to read that out and get those numbers into our computer. And there are many different ways um, and, and factors that influence that process. So first of all, there are two main architectures for these photosensitive elements. Um, one is called CMOS and the other is called CCD for charged coupled device. Probably both terms you've heard before. The main difference is that a CMOS has itself a little um, analog and, and uh, charge to voltage converter built, in, built into the chip itself. So there are transistors here, around, right here on the photosensitive material that convert the charge into a voltage. That voltage is then sent to an analog to digital converter and converted into a digital number. A CCD, on the other hand, does not have this analog to voltage converter built in. That happens outside at the end of the chip. And that means that all these photosensitive elements share the exact same analog to voltage converter, which in the end is, makes it easier to do that process exactly the same for all photosensitive elements. And that is why, until not uh, uh, too long ago, CCDs were really the instrument of choice in scientific imaging. That's no longer the case, and I'll explain that in the second lecture. So in general, a CMOS, each pixel has its own amplifier. Uh, they're fast, but they tend to be much noisier, although again, there are newer variants that have lower noise and are actually highly interesting. CCDs are slower, but they're more precise, lower noise. Okay, so I'll be talking now mainly about how those CCDs work. How do they read out the charge that they accumulate? And one beautiful analogy is this um, bucket brigade idea. So, Think about your photosensitive wells as little buckets that are sitting on a conveyor belt. It is raining and we want to measure how much rain is falling into each of these individual buckets. Well, what do we do? We stop the rain and then we start transporting this um, array of buckets, uh, one column at a time, into this serial bucket array here at the end. So we get all the water from this last row here into this serial row and subsequently we can now read out bucket by bucket into our measuring cylinder how much water actually fell in, into each individual bucket. And so as long as we get, keep our administration straight, in the end we know exactly which bucket had how much water. You can, for instance, already see here, or this analogy also beautifully explains that if you want to read this out faster, that you have to read out in this single element faster and faster how much water was in there, and you can see that that's going to be less accurate. And that's in generally true. The faster you read out a CCD, the more noise you get. Now, this is a very fair uh, analogy, and it works extremely well and you are perfectly fine to just remember this. Nevertheless, um, I do want to give you a bit of an idea of what is really going on. So that CCD chip basically consists of that semiconductor material. Here we're looking on the top. There are channel stops that keep the charge confined between these uh, rows here. And those electrodes is what's going to be used to 
uh, channel the charge through the chip. So here's a uh, cross section where we see the channel stops and we see the electrodes on top, the semiconductor material that will accumulate charge. When we now start an exposure, what is going to happen is that photons will be coming in, they're being transformed into electrons, which we often actually call photoelectrons. And those photoelectrons will be kept in the central part of the chip because we happen to put a, a charge, a positive charge, onto that central electrode. So this will keep the electrons right there under that charged electron. So once we're done with the exposure, we stop the incoming photons, we're now going to read it out. And so um, what, what is going to happen is that we're going to put a sequence of voltages over these three electrodes on every chip, and that will, in the end, have the net effect that it will move the charge through the chip. So up here, we see the, 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 the voltages that are going to be applied to these individual electrons. So here, at this point in time, we see that the voltage is 5 volt for this uh, third uh, electrode. And then when we now cycle through, we now have both the second and third electrode uh, high that will smear out this electron package over two-thirds of the chip. Subsequently, we bring down that third electrode, so we now already moved by one-third of a pixel that electron charge. We do the same trick again with the, with the next um, electrode here. We bring that up, smear out the voltage package, uh, and so on and so on, until in the end we move the charge out of this pixel and into the next one. And so this process repeats itself over and over and over again at a rate of uh, many million times a second to read out the charge that was accumulated in your CCD chip. There was one little trick here, and that's that I was telling you that it stopped raining at a certain point in time, um, that the photons stopped coming. Um, in reality, that's of course not the case. So we must use some kind of trick to stop that light from re uh, reaching the photo sensor. And um, that problem is the basis of these different CCD architectures. So the chip that I described was this full frame chip. And basically, uh, in that case, what you have to do is when you start reading it out, you have to put a shutter in front of the chip so that no more light is reaching it. Um, that's of course not nice because shutters are bulky, they make movement, they uh, are slow. So um, there's a few other tricks. One trick is this so-called frame transfer architecture. What happens here is that the actual chip is twice the size of the, um, uh, the, the part that you can work with where half the chip is dark, so there's like an aluminum layer on, uh, uh, built on top of the chip so no light can ever reach it. You can now very quickly clock the charge of this part of the chip in one go into the lower half of the chip, and then you can start reading out that lower half at leisure, as fast as you want, and you can already start exposing that upper part of the frame transfer chip. This works very well, except when you have very bright objects in that upper half, and then you will see these lines smearing. So there's another uh, trick, and that is so-called interline transfer architecture. And so what happens there is that we have alternating columns of photosensitive uh, cells and dark cells. And now we can, in one movement, we can go from the exposed into the dark area. So we move from here to here in a very quick move. And then we can read out that interspersed dark area of the chip. Now that has clearly a downside, and that is that like half the area of our chip cannot see light because it's dark. And so one trick to get around that is to put little micro lenses on top of these uh, 
2 and to direct the light that normally would hit the dark pixel into the light pixel. And so these two architectures, frame transfer and interline transfer, are what we'll mainly be uh, seeing later on. So one remaining question or one question that is very often asked is why are we not using color cameras for this uh, microscopy? And the reason for that is that we really care about our light budget. So any photon that is going to uh, hit the camera, we want to measure them. We want cameras with a high quantum efficiency. We really want to see all the light that is possible. And so a color CCD has the fundamental uh, issue that that uh, doesn't help you in that regard because a color CCD is nothing else but a monochrome CCD with little colored masks on top of each pixel. And the most commonly masked is called the Bayer mask that consists of two green pixels, a blue and a red one. Um, the image is being read out. The intensity information is being taken from each pixel, but the color information is actually calculated in the computer or in the firmware of the camera from the information of the, those neighboring differently colored pixels. And so that means that you know, we throw away at least one th uh, two thirds of the light at every pixel. Um, and we also get like an interpolated image and not really the real image. So in, in most, by far most uh, fluorescence microscopy image where we care about the uh, photons, you will not see um, color CCDs. So that's it for this first part of detectors. I do want to mention uh, Kurt, Kurt Thorne, who uh, has contributed quite a bit of material to this talk. Also, this website, micro.magnet.fsu.edu, uh, is a great resource for everything microscopy related. And there were a few uh, illustrations that I used from them. And I also used some materials from Wikipedia. <laughs>